the Bellevue City Council regular meeting for uh, Tuesday, September 8th, 2020. Welcome back from the break. I'm really glad to see everybody for the first time at our meeting tonight. Um, City Clerk, can you do the roll call, please? Sure. Mayor Robinson? Here. Deputy Mayor Newenhouse? Here. Council Member Barksdale? Here. Council Member Lee? Here. Council Member Robertson? Council Member Robertson? Here. Thank you. <laughs> Council Member Stokes? Here. Thank you. Council Member Zahn? Here. Thank you. So we have two proclamations to read tonight. The first one is Childhood Cancer Month Proclamation. Deputy Mayor Newenhouse, could you read that, please? Uh, certainly. Whereas uh, pediatric cancer is the leading cause of death by disease in children, and whereas one in 285 children in the United States will be diagnosed with some form of cancer by their 20th birthday, and whereas 80% of childhood cancer cases are diagnosed only after the disease has metastasized and spread to other parts of the body, and whereas two thirds of childhood cancer patients will have long lasting chronic conditions as a result of the treatment they go through. And whereas there has been 24% increase in pediatric cancer cases over the last 40 years, equal to 43 children per day, or 15,780 children a year diagnosed with cancer in the US. And whereas the National Cancer Institute recognize the unique research needs of childhood cancer and increased funding to conduct this research. And whereas researchers and healthcare professionals work diligently to dedicate their expertise to treat and cure children with cancer. And whereas too many children are affected by this deadly disease and more must be done to raise awareness and to find a cure for all childhood cancers. Now, therefore, on behalf of Lynn Robinson, mayor of the city of Bellevue, Washington, and on behalf of its city council to hereby proclaim this month of September 2020 as Childhood Cancer Awareness Month and encourage all people in Bellevue to join us in this special observance. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, the next one is National Recovery Month and uh, Council Member Zahn, could you read that please? Yes, absolutely, Mayor. I think it's really important with, especially with COVID and everyone, so many being inside Whereas behavioral health is an essential part of one's overall wellness, and whereas preventing overcoming mental and substance use disorders is essential to achieving healthy lifestyles, both physically and emotionally, and whereas an estimated 400,000 people in King County are affected by related conditions, and whereas as a community, we must encourage those we know with mental and or substance use disorders to implement preventive measures, recognize the signs of a problem and guide those in need to the appropriate treatment. And whereas to help more people achieve and sustain long-term recovery, the US Department of Health and Human Services, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, King County, and the city of Bellevue invite all residents of Bellevue to participate in National Recovery Month. Now, therefore, on behalf of Lynn Robinson, mayor of the city of Bellevue, Washington, and on behalf of its city council, do hereby proclaim the month of September 2020 as National Recovery Month in Bellevue and call upon the people of Bellevue to observe this month with appropriate programs, activities, and ceremonies to support this year's theme, rising above it all, wellness, resilience, and recovery. Thank you, council members on. So now we're on to the approval of the agenda and we have to amend the agenda to include an item in the city manager's report. And then also we are going to at the request of council member Lee, move item F from the consent calendar to other ordinances for further discussion. Is there a motion? Yes, I move to approve the agenda amended to add one item under the report of the city manager regarding an update to the mayor's pledge and then move item 8F from the consent calendar for discussion under other ordinances, resolutions and motions. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay. Thank you. 
All right, so we're on to oral communications, City Clerk. Do we have any uh, <coughs> for oral communications? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this evening, there were no speakers signed up for oral communications. Okay, so now we have the report of the City Manager, Mr. Miyake. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I have two items to report on with uh, respect to the City Manager's report. The first one is um, the Amazon donation to the for the city of Bellevue Human Services Fund in the tune of $1 million over the next four years, specifically to be used for human services. We have joining us, um, Brian Huseman, a Vice President of Public Policy from Amazon. And I'd like to just turn over the stage to him to provide a few remarks to the council, Brian. Hi there, thank you, City Manager uh, Miyaki and, and Mayor Robinson and, and Deputy Mayor Newenhouse and Council Members. I really appreciate the opportunity and the time on the agenda this evening. I am Brian Huseman, a Vice President of uh, Public Policy at Amazon. And Amazon is so proud uh, to be growing in Bellevue. I think as you all know, our, our founder and CEO, Jeff Bezos, he started the company in the garage uh, right here in Bellevue. And since that time, we've been pleased to have been a significant investor and job creator for people for all backgrounds and skills across the entire Puget Sound region. And we have more than 55,000 employees across the region, including 3,000 employees working uh, right in Bellevue. Um, we opened our first office in Bellevue in 2017 because it has exactly what Amazon is looking for in a community, a high quality of life, a fantastic talent pool, great amenities, and a business friendly environment. Um, and that's why on Friday, we announced that we'll be bringing 10,000 more jobs to Bellevue over the next few years. And that's in addition to the 15,000 uh, jobs we announced uh, back in February. We're very excited by that and just thrilled with the excellent working relationship uh, we have between uh, your staff and between uh, you all as city leaders and Definitely that collaborative attitude and solutions-based approach helps us and it helps, I think, all businesses, large and small, provide uh, consistency and clarity. Um, so, but our, in addition to bringing these jobs, our commitment to the community uh, is really key. We want to be a fabric, part of the fabric of Bellevue, and we want to be uh, a good neighbor. And so as, as an in initial and small down payment on that commitment, uh, as the city manager mentioned, we're pleased to make a $1 million donation to supplement uh, your human services fund. And we hope that those funds, which uh, the Human Services Commission will allocate over the next two funding cycles, will bring additional resources uh, to bear to help support families in need. And, you know, I know that, uh, you know, with COVID, it's been challenging, uh, you know, with everyone and, you know, has amplified existing hardships. But uh, we are really impressed at Amazon by uh, the city's simple but effective tool to get funds in the hands of nonprofit uh, organizations and support those families in need. And we're very proud to help stretch that work uh, just a little bit further. So again, I'd like to thank you all for time on the uh, agenda. If you have any questions, if you have suggestions about how Amazon can be a good partner or a good neighbor, please contact me or my staff. Uh, We've got uh, Jared Axelrod and Guy Palumbo uh, working uh, very closely uh, with you all. Amazon really looks forward uh, to a long and productive and growing partnership with Bellevue, and I thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Huseman. Uh, Mr. Miyake, what's the other part? Okay. So the other one is uh, with regard to a status update on the pledge. Um, you know, I just wanted to take a minute to update the council on the progress we're making on the council's pledge to review um, public safety practice and in particular the police use of force. Um, by way of background, after the tragic death of George Floyd earlier this year, citizens across the nation and locally uh, were moved to evaluate the continued reality of systemic racism. As a result, the council pledged uh, to review police use of force policies and procedures to identify any needed reforms as a way of creating meaningful <clears throat> change that ensures the safety and respect for black and brown people and other people of color. Um, your pledge, uh, as you might recall, encompasses four steps. The first one is reviewing the police department's use of force policies. The second is engaging the community by including a diverse range of input experiences and stories in the review. Third, reporting out the findings of the review to the community and seeking feedback. And fourth, reforming, if necessary, the department's use of force policies. 
In line with the direction of the pledge, we are moving into the review and engagement phase of the pledge, which in turn will lead to a report and identification reforms that may be needed um, to reach our objective of eliminating systemic racism and ensuring that Bellevue's values are reflected within these critical policing policies. As I alluded to earlier, an objective of this phase of the pledge process is to understand how policing policies can continue to be improved to ensure black, brown, and other people of color are safe and respected, which in turn will ensure the entire community is well served by this important uh, public safety function. Now, we do believe that Bellevue has made strides in this area already through the community policing relationships that we have been built by the women and men of the Bellevue Police Department, but it's important that we continue to engage with the community to understand where we can continue to push uh, ourselves further in this respect. The sediment represents the culture of the police department. As Chief Milet often says, um, part of the mission of the Bellevue Police Department is to ensure that people in Bellevue feel safe and, and actually are safe, that we must work with the community to ensure this is true for all people. So in order to launch this work, we needed to hire specialized uh, expertise in the form of an independent, uh, reputable third party. And I'm pleased to share <clears throat> that we now, excuse me, <clears throat> have a consultant on board the consultant is the Office of Independent Review Group, also known as OIR, and is based out of Playa del Rey, California. The five-member consulting team has a combined experience of nearly 100 years in review of law enforcement practices and policy, and the team members have broad, deep, well-respected expertise and experience. This team has substantial experience on police internal investigations and critical incident reviews, including police involved shootings and deaths while in custody. They've also conducted multiple evaluations of oversight systems and even entire policing operations and are very capable facilitators of public forums and have faithfully incorporated uh, public feedback in their recommendations. So some examples where team members have provided similar expertise are in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, recently in Santa Clara County, California, Los Angeles County, California, Ferguson, Missouri, and Charlotte, North Carolina, just to name a few. Uh, since the council's pledge became public, uh, my executive team have been actively searching for consulting groups with the right skills and balanced approach that would fit Bellevue. And recognizing this type of expertise is very specialized in high demand across the country. We reached out to agencies, professional associations, and academic institutions for referrals. Some of the criteria we used in the search were consultants that had clear and substantial knowledge of policing policies and practicing practices, a track record of a balanced review and objective perspective, had widely respected expertise, were highly experienced in public engagement and have worked specific incidents involving people of color with law enforcement and <clears throat> brought to the table a strong perspective outside of law enforcement, such as through academics, law firms, and independent research firms. After several conversations with professional organizations, as well as experts in this field across the country, referrals led to other referrals, which led to hiring the Office of Independent Review Group as I mentioned, also known as OIR. I am very happy to report that OIR has begun its evaluation of the department's use of force policies, and we are already mapping out the logistics for gathering public input using virtual platforms and anticipate the community engagement process to begin in late September, early October. Um, I will provide the council with more details within the next two weeks on the community forums, and we'll make sure updates are pushed out to the community through our website and other channels. And as we work to progress, um, make progress with this this fall, I will continue to keep the council informed with relevant updates. So this concludes um, both of my reports for this evening, Mayor. Sorry. Um, on to the consent calendar. Do I have a motion to approve the consent calendar? Yes, I move to approve the consent calendar. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. So we have uh, two resolutions tonight and two public hearings. And Mr. Miyake, would you like to introduce those for us? Sure, Mayor. We have <clears throat> two public hearings um, this evening uh, with regard to a relinquishment of 
easements. The first one is a, a partial release of two utility easements, one sewer, one water. Um, the easements were declared surplus back on October, August 3rd uh, of 2020. Um, and uh, following the public hearing, um, we are asking the council um, if they're ready to take action on the proposed resolution to release portions of these two easements in front of you this evening with regard to the public hearing. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn over to Ira McDaniel, our real property manager. Ira? All right, thank you, Mr. Miyake. And good evening, Mayor and Council members. Our first staff report is on a request to release a portion of a sewer easement and a portion of a water easement located at 515 116th Avenue Northeast. And tonight's public hearing is to allow the public an opportunity to comment on the release. Um, so this is uh, the property outlined in purple. It's the city's Lincoln Center property, which many of you are familiar with. Uh, Sound Transit's east link alignment goes through this property as shown here, running from east to west through the property. And uh, Sound Transit's guideway columns are in locations that conflicted with our old utility alignments. Sound Transit rerouted our water and sewer lines to run around those column locations. And as a part of their permitting process, Sound Transit's requested that we release, uh, that we partially release the sewer easement and the water easement. So the portions to be released are shown here in yellow. Uh, the existing easements are in solid green and solid blue. And then the cross hatcher shows the uh, new easement alignments to kind of wow out around those columns. Um, so that's the story with this one. And following the staff report and the public hearing, we'll request council action on the proposed resolution authorizing the partial release partial release of these easements. This ends the staff report. Are there any questions? Okay, well, let's uh, let's get a motion to open the public hearing first. I, I move to open the public hearing. Okay. Is there, is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, um, city clerk, do we have any public testimony to hear? Mayor, uh, there were no speakers signed up before the public hearing this evening that had pre-registered. At this point, I would ask if there is anyone on the call as a participant that would like to speak, please use the raised hand function or please use star nine if you're connected with a phone. And Mayor, there is no one indicating they would like to speak. Okay, thank you. So uh, let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Is there a motion to do that? I move to close the public hearing. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, we can now, if anybody has any questions um, or anything to discuss, now is a good time. I can see everybody. There we go. Okay, any any questions or anything to discuss with Ira? Okay, seeing heads shaken. Uh, let's go ahead and make a motion to approve this. Okay, I move to approve resolution 9816 authorizing execution of documents necessary to release a portion of an existing sewer easement and a portion of the existing water easement located at 515 116th Avenue Northeast that has been declared surplus to city needs. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, resolution 9816 passes. And now we have resolution 9817. Mr. Miyake or Ira, did you want to? Yeah, this in? is, uh, I'll just do a quick opener here. This is uh, for release of a water utility easement. Um, again, this was, uh, this easement was declared surplus back on August 3rd of 2020. And again, following the public hearing, the council will be asked to take action on the proposed resolution to release the surplus easement. Again, I'm gonna go ahead and turn over to Ira McDaniel for a quick staff report, Ira. Thank you. Um, our second staff report is on a request to release a water easement located at 1111 118th Avenue Southeast. Um, and again, tonight's public hearing is to allow the public an opportunity to comment on the release. Uh, the property in question is located again here in pink off of 118th Avenue South, just south of Southeast 8th. Um, this property is being redeveloped and uh, the easement for our old water line, which is shown here in red or orange crosshatcher, is in conflict with the proposed new four-story self-storage facility 
um, all of the water lines that are on the property will be decommissioned and all of the new water main facilities will be to the east of the property inside the public road right of way. So there's no longer a, a need for this easement. Um, so again, as a part of their permitting process, the owner has requested that we release the old water main. Um, so what, following the public hearing, staff will request council action on the proposed resolution authorizing the release of this easement. Um, and that's the end of this staff report. Are there any questions before opening the public hearing? Um, let's go ahead and open it and then we'll, we can ask questions after Ira. Okay, okay. thank you. I move um, to open the public hearing. Second. Sorry, Mayor. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, is there any um, public testimony for the city clerk? Uh, as with the first hearing, there were no pre-registered speakers. So at this point, I would ask if there's anyone connected to the call that would like to speak, please use the raise hand function or star nine if you're connected with a phone. Mayor, it doesn't appear that there is anyone raising their hand. Okay, let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Is there a motion for that? I move to close the public hearing. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. So go, we'll open this for um, any questions or discussion. Is there anything anybody wants to ask or say? Others, otherwise, just shake your head and we'll move on to the vote. Okay, thank you. So let's go ahead and um, get a motion to pass this resolution. I move to approve resolution 9817, authorizing execution of documents necessary to release the existing water line easement located at 1111 118th Avenue Southeast, which has been declared surplus of city needs. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? So resolution 9817 has been adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, then we have a study session item. We get to get an um, economic development update. Yay. Mr. Miyake. Sure. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members. We do have in, in front of you this evening an economic development, that economic development update. Materials were provided in your packet um, earlier. Um, <clears throat> this is one of our routine uh, update to the Council regarding the economic development, uh, the economic development work plan. Uh, tonight's pro, uh, presentation has a very special focus on uh, reopening efforts in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, um, joining us this evening is Jesse Canado, our Chief Economic Development Officer, as well as Chris Goddard, uh, our Public-Private Partnership Manager. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Jesse. Thank you, City Manager Miyagi. Uh, Mayor, Deputy Mayor, members of Council, we're very happy to be here with you tonight, even in the uh, the uncertain circumstances around the economy to share more about the work that's been happening between the city and our, our community partners to help uh, support the business community and our residents through this um, through this time. Chris, next slide, please. So tonight is uh, for information only. We're not seek, seeking specific action for the, from the council, but we will, of course, uh, entertain questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. On tonight's agenda, it'll be a mix of um, items that highlight some of the challenges faced by the Bellevue community um, over the last few months, as well as the strong efforts that have been made um, by the city and our partners um, to help with the reopening efforts and help provide some additional certainty uh, for our businesses um, as they weather the pandemic. I'm in the midst of um, all of the, the different activities and, and the uncertainty. Um, the city has responded well and is well positioned relative to some of our peers and we will we'll discuss that tonight. Uh, the specific agenda items are a future of office such as we can uh, share today. We'll talk a little bit about some of the exits uh, that have happened locally. Uh, quick info on the um, efforts to get the PPE equipment out to the community. A briefing on our work citywide to help uh, our restaurants in particular with expanding outdoor operations. Discussion of some of the welcome back messaging that's being led by the chamber. Um, info on the Heart of Bellevue campaign that the Bellevue Downtown Association is working on to help um, increase consumer confidence. 
some reporting on our small business work and some of the financial support that local businesses have been able to access. And as always, we'll end um, with an update to the council on what's next and what activities they'll be seeing or updates they'll receive over the next few months. Next slide, please. So teeing it up with uh, the future of Office, of course, we'll start with last week's exciting news uh, that Amazon will be leasing an additional 2 million square feet of office space that's being built by Vulcan and bring an additional 10,000 jobs into Bellevue. With that announcement, uh, their leases mean that all office space currently under construction in the city is spoken for and fully leased. This does reflect continued optimism and confidence in Bellevue and our office market. Um, in addition to Vulcan's work, uh, Schneitzer West, Scansa, and Columbia Pacific Advisors have all publicly signaled their desire to start construction on their respective office projects later this year or early next. Um, so again, a lot of confidence. Our downtown office vacancy rate remains very healthy, 3.9%. Uh, um, so meaning that 96% uh, of our office space is occupied at this time. The new construction, um, and the, the signals that they, more office space will start construction is being supported by our office brokers who indicate that a lot of our smaller tenants in particular, those requiring less than 10,000 square feet are starting to actively look in the market again. Um, so still lots of interest in Bellevue as the place to be for, uh, for in large employers, for small employers, um, and for many employees. Um, from the companies we've spoken with, they are foreseeing a hybrid future once the COVID-19 is more firmly under control, um, a hybrid future where there will be more work from home opportunities for their employees, but where their employees will still be in the office two to three days a week. Um, there are a lot of benefits from the additional flexibility of work from home, but many of them do anticipate and see a, a strong need for um, all hands meetings, um, whiteboarding sessions, innovation sessions to be happening in the office because a lot of that requires um, very deep in-person collaboration and spontaneity that just isn't achievable uh, through online means. So additionally, um, what we're hearing from our employers is that the pre-COVID trend of individual space becoming smaller, so individual workspaces um, shrinking, may reverse uh, with firms taking more square foot more square feet per employee to help provide for that additional physical distancing that may continue to be required. So the, the counterbalancing trends of additional work from home with more space per employee may end up um, balancing out and, and being a net wash in terms of office space demand. But that's um, a lot of that is still uncertain. That's just what we're seeing in the market at the moment. Um, but we do know that uh, many of our office, larger employers in particular, our office uh, tenants have signaled that they will not return to the office in force for at least another three to six months. So we are keeping tabs on that. We are engaged with our large employers, Amazon, Facebook, Salesforce, and others uh, to understand what their needs are, what their trends are, and make sure that we can be proactive in helping them create a safe environment for their employees and their customers to get back to. Um, for the moment, the prolonged duration of the work from home does mean, of course, fewer workers um, in downtown, fewer visitors, and therefore fewer customers for our downtown restaurants and retailers. Um, so we will talk a little bit more in depth then about how we're helping to support those particular industries uh, to help buffer them during these, uh, these quiet months in our central business district. Um, quick note, on the slide, you are seeing the results from the Bellevue Downtown Association's survey of their members to see what um, the pandemic and the future looks like for them. Of the 65 members who did respond, it was a mixed bag on what, uh, what the future of office means for them. So 32% said yes, that um, future work from home trends would impact their space needs, 41% said no, and 27% said they were unsure. So again, reflecting that there is still a lot of uncertainty, but um, as we look kind of projecting out into the future, we do anticipate more of that hybrid model taking hold. Next slide, please. Next, on a slightly less, uh, on a less enthusiastic note, there were some exits uh, that happened in the last six weeks. 
perhaps the most notable one being the announcement last month that REI intends to sell its spring district facilities. Uh, this is unfortunate, but as we understand that it really was a decision made in the best interest of the company and keeping the company positioned amid the uncertain retail environment. It was not a reflection on Bellevue's business climate or the relationship that they built with city staff in preparing for, for their HQ. In fact, city staff is working with their real estate team to see if we can find a space that meets their reduced needs. Uh, we still hope to have a Bellevue be the home for REI's smaller headquarters. Um, and while it's unfortunate that the co-op will not occupy the building, um, it, we are still uh, fortunate that they are delivering a beautiful, bespoke, and very sustainable building that will be a gem for Bellevue and a gem for the ultimate owners and occupiers. Uh, the building will be LEED certified um, and will include best in class energy efficiency, numerous um, outdoor spaces uh, to connect the future employees with the outdoors. And the landscaping is filled with uh, sustainable native and very edible vegetation, as you can tell from uh, the numerous fruit bearing trees, the strawberry plants, um, and the grapevines that have been planted around the campus. The eventual owner and the eventual um, user of the building will definitely have a best in class asset, uh, dare I say a trophy, a trophy building here in the Spring District. So while we are said that they will not be, the REI will not be the primary occupant of the building, they are still delivering a benefit for the city in the long term. Um, there is no details on who the, the potential buyers of that space may be at this time. On the retail side, uh, Dallas-based Neiman Marcus um, did announce as well their intention to close six stores across the country as part of their pathway back to profitability. Um, that does include their space at the Bravern, which will, that closing of that store will open up about 120,000 square feet of space. Um, for retail. While the space will go dark for a bit, it does also open up an opportunity to reposition that space for the future. We have spoken with uh, the mall's owners as well as the property managers, and they are, while they are said that Neiman Marcus is exiting quite early from their lease, they are also very enthusiastic about the opportunities to re-tenant the space as they look at all of the growth uh, coming into downtown Bellevue, the new residents, the new employees, the new um, tourism related infrastructure that Visibility was working on, they do see a very bright future for that space um, and are very confident they will be able to re-tenant it uh, with the right folks. Um, on the note of smaller, more local businesses, um, food and beverage is definitely another segment that has been facing some significant headwinds. Um, while fast food and takeout options are performing particularly well at this time, sit-down restaurants have been uh, struggling significantly, especially in our downtown core, where there is, again, a reduced foot traffic. In, in the downtown area, Heavy Restaurant Group perhaps is the most notable for having announced the permanent closure of Purple Lot Number 3 in their Cast Iron Studios uh, space. Those spaces, like many of our downtown restaurants, really depended on that midday peak um, office occupancy, all of the, the workers coming in, uh, for lunch, staying for happy hour, grabbing dinner before going home. So the dramatic decline in, um, in office occupancy for the short term has definitely had an effect on their business. So we are working with the Downtown Association, the Chamber, and, the, uh, and other organizations to help do, bring uh, some additional light um, and focus onto the businesses downtown. Again, to bring uh, some, some focus so that folks from outside of Bellevue and even Bellevue residents know that there are still great restaurants and great businesses uh, to patronize in our downtown core. And again, much like our office market, um, even with some of those spaces going dark, there's still a very great interest in Bellevue. Um, just the other day, uh, the STK Steakhouse announced their intention to take over the old Palomino's space at the intersection of Bellevue Way and the Grand Connection. Um, that is um, a very notable new tenant coming into downtown because that particular steakhouse has locations on Collins Avenue in Miami, um, in San Diego's Gaslamp District, on Denver's 15th Street Mall, and on New York's High Line. So uh, quite a, an impressive list of locations and to have Bellevue added onto that list definitely signals um, strong interest and, and confidence in the future of our uh, downtown core and our restaurant scene. Um, but as I was noting, you know, the decreased amount of traffic definitely highlights the need 
to draw people into downtown for reasons other than work. And with that, uh, I will hand it over to Chris to detail some of the, the efforts that we're participating in to help draw those, those feet into the, into the, the businesses. Thank you, Jesse. It's great. And, and you can go ahead to the next slide, please. Uh, so good evening, uh, Mayor Robinson, Deputy Mayor Newhouse, Council members. Again, thank you. Um, so due to the impact of the pandemic and uh, unprecedented challenges facing our local businesses, we wanted to share some of these positive stories and some of the examples of how our team and our local partners are being proactive with efforts to help the economy rebound. Uh, fundamental to our economic recovery is ensuring a safe environment for our residents, visitors, employees to return to participating in the, in the economy. Whether you're visiting a restaurant or a store or an office, or if you're an employee of any business, uh, having access to proper PPE is essential. Uh, and with that, I'd like to highlight and thank the Bellevue Chamber for their efforts in this space through their partnership with the city and with King County, along with delivery assistance uh, by the Amazon uh, treasure trucks uh, from One Redmond and, and Amazon. The chamber is able to provide over a thousand businesses with more than 120,000 masks and more than 3,500 bottles of hand sanitizer. Uh, and in addition, the chamber also assisted the city with distribution of, of 60,000 cloth, faith, uh, faith cover, uh, cloth face coverings to our uh, local residents. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and as Jesse just touched on, uh, the challenges facing our local restaurants are numerous. Uh, safe start reopening restrictions on indoor seating capacity and reduced interest in indoor dining from restaurant patrons concerned about possible COVID-19 risks have really threatened uh, the viability of some of our restaurants and bars. And so in response, the city is really focused on facilitating expanded outdoor dining options and to provide restaurants expanded revenue generating opportunities and a safe environment for our residents to feel like they can come out and safely participate in the economy. Uh, for restaurants and bars citywide, the city has created and aggressively promoted resource, resource guides highlighting some of our existing tools like our sidewalk cafe permits. Um, for expansion of dining in the right of way and our land use temporary uh, use permits for expansion on private property. Um, in Old Bellevue, as many of you have maybe heard, uh, you know, following extensive community engagement, city staff work closely with Main Street businesses, residents, the Old Bellevue Merchants Association and the BDA to facilitate the city's first ever on-street dining program uh, where we were able to convert on-street parking spaces into outdoor restaurant space. Through these efforts, we've seen 10 food and beverage establishments apply for sidewalk cafes. We've opened five on-street uh, dining locations, and, and this work has also sparked interest and received out, and we've received well, quite a bit of outreach from many of the small businesses uh, from across the city interested in expanding outdoor options. Included in that are, are five additional uh, temporary use permits where we've seen businesses, again, expand into, the, into their own private property. Uh, you'll note on this slide a quote from a Main Street business owner following our work with him uh, to deliver on street dining where he's said that this has really been a game changer in terms of revenue for the restaurant and couldn't be happier. Really hopes that this is something that can become an annual tradition. There are many more quotes like this where that came from and we look forward to returning to council in November to give a full debrief on these efforts. Next slide, please. Uh, in addition to responding to immediate business needs, city staff and our partners have also been proactive in thinking about how we can accelerate um, our recovery. Uh, since the early days of the pandemic, staff have participated in the Bellevue Chamber-led efforts to develop a campaign welcoming residents, businesses, tourists to reemerge and re-engage in our economy, uh, as well as a shared strategy for elevating Eastside communities and showcasing our businesses, events, and our quality of life. Uh, this initiative, uh, through those efforts, is coined Eastside Together, strives to unite our Eastside communities and drive a rapid and robust economic recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, leveraging some of the key themes and messaging tied to our tradition of cross-sector collaboration, our visionary approach to problem solving, and as our uh, Amazon colleague tonight uh, referenced, our business-friendly environment. Uh, this initiative really will use partners to create and aggregate content and uh, that can be amplified through those daily social media posts, paid ads, earned media, you know, again, really driving home the, the message of, of, of the Eastside's collaboration and, and it being a great place to, be, uh, to do business. So stay tuned. This is uh, getting ready to launch and the formal Eastside Together kind of, uh, campaign will launch uh, and we'll be sure to update you on that. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, moving from uh, messaging efforts at, at a regional east side level, the city has also been deeply engaged uh, with the Bellevue Downtown Association on a recovery campaign designed to support and retain uh, businesses and attract customers back to downtown, or as the, as the campaign suggests, the heart of Bellevue. This partnership-based placemaking and marketing effort really builds off the success of our, our work last year, the city's 2019 Grand Connection Activation Partnership. Um, and, and this time around, it's been really designed to promote downtown's offering, drive uh, downtown's offerings, drive activity and foot traffic back to the, uh, to the downtown, strengthen downtown's sense of place, connect customers, residents with our local businesses, and, and ultimately boost economic activity. Since launching earlier this summer, the BDA's multifaceted campaign has included in-person visits with nearly 65 local small businesses, print and digital marketing efforts, highlighting dozens of local businesses across Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as 30 long-form in-depth interviews with individual business owners. Um, they've also profiled and, and promoted downtown stories of activity and creativity and recovery, highlighting things like the virtual uh, summer music series, interviews with local artists that would have otherwise been at the uh, arts fair that had to be canceled, um, and as well as highlighting Bellevue's numerous outdoor escapes. Um, and again, this is all in addition to the colorful lanterns and the Heart of Bellevue banners along the Grand Connection, and as well as what you'll soon see um, along the 555 Vulcan site, a kind of a construction wrap along that fencing that includes additional kind of Heart of Bellevue uh, campaign materials. Uh, and uh, beyond that, I also just want to highlight that, you know, one of the many ways this content is reaching the community is through the BDA's weekly email blast to more than 10,500 recipients. I think since the start of the campaign, I, I think their open rate is on that blast is at, at close to 30% or over 30%, meaning that you know more than 3,000 people per week are engaging with this content, and that's in addition to uh, all of the views that are there and the thousands of views that they're reaching through different social media channels. And again, we're going to be really excited to come back and report back to council on on the uh, all the details of this campaign later in in the um, in the fall. Next slide, please. And uh, lastly, we just wanted to provide a council with an update on the small business support efforts connected to financial assistance. Um, with regards to the federal paycheck, uh, paycheck protection program or, or PPP for short, uh, data is still limited at this time, but what we do know is that more than 4,000 uh, businesses in Bellevue have applied for and received PPP loans to retain employees and pay critical business expenses. Uh, these loans were limited to businesses with 500 or fewer employees, and the vast majority of those Bellevue loans, close to 3,400, were made below $150,000, indicating strong penetration with our small businesses. Uh, for, the, uh, for the Bellevue Small Business, grant, Business Relief Grant, which is still accepting applications through September 17th, we've already received more than 200 applications. And as you know, ensuring robust outreach and awareness uh, regarding these critical resources th uh, throughout our diverse community is perhaps one of the most important things that we can do and, and that our staff has really prioritized at this time. You know, for example, as we continue to spread the word on the loans and grant opportunities um, that are available, we've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with community partners like the India Association of Western Washington, the Chinese Information and Service Center, Eastside for All, uh, the Small Business Education Hub, in addition to steady outreach to over 20 ethnic chambers and business associations. Uh, on, to on top of that, we continue to back this outreach up with really in-depth technical assistance uh, in accessing and applying for these loans in any language requested through our partnership with the Business Impact Northwest. So more efforts on all of these, uh, more information on all of these efforts uh, can be available and found on our website at the bottom of this final slide, if you don't mind going to the final slide. And with that, I will hand it back over to Jesse. Thank you, Chris. Um, so hopefully the council has a very robust understanding of the, the ways we're engaging with our community partners. A lot of that work will continue into the fall and into early next year. So in terms of what's coming to the council or what the council may see over the next couple of months, um, the economic development plan update is continuing on track. We will be back on the 21st with the, the full draft plan for the council's review and then hopefully back for session number nine, which will be the final session in early November for adoption. The small business grants that Chris just mentioned will be wrapping up and we will come back 
um, with those final allocations on the consent calendar. Very confident that we'll have a robust, um, robust applicant pool in there, as Chris mentioned already, over 200 applications. 56% of those uh, business applicants are um, women-owned businesses. 37% are um, immigrant or refugee-owned businesses. So definitely doing uh, very well within a diverse set of, of uh, the business community. Um, we'll be back with a full report, um, lessons learned and possible next steps on main streets and all the work that we've been doing um, with outdoor dining. Bellwether will continue this year. It'll be in a virtual format, but we will continue um, the annual arts festival for, for the East Side. Um, and you'll get a pre-briefing on that um, in November before it launches. And then there will be a report from uh, the BDA on their Heart of Bellevue work, again, with lessons learned and potential next steps on how we can continue um, to position Bellevue as uh, the heart and soul of the East Side and as um, the economic heart of the Puget Sound. So with that, uh, we will open it up for questions and comments from the council. Great, thank you very much. That was a really good presentation. Um, we'll give it everybody a chance. It is for information only, but I'm sure we have comments or questions. So I'm gonna um, call on you in this order, council member Lee, followed by council member Zahn, council member Robertson, Stokes, Deputy Mayor Noonhouse, Councilmember Barksdale, and then myself. So with that, Councilmember Lee, do you have any comments or questions? Thank you, Madam Mayor. A good report, uh, nice work, you know, specific to the audience, the target you were going after in this particular effort. Well done. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, the, the statistics are always good, you know, I and mean, it's good information. So I don't need to go into all the specifics, but just the questions. Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, some of these uh, businesses that are going out, like, you know, REI and uh, Braven, uh, Neiman Marcus, and so on. And we're hoping that there's a good prospect that new business will move in. And in fact, you mentioned some company from or what Texas already made some inquiries. So I'm just wondering, where do these leads, uh, new inquiries coming from? Uh, you know, where they came from the regional economic partners, you know, like GSP, or uh, did us, did we actively uh, pursue these businesses? And if we do, what are we doing? If we don't, perhaps we should be considering doing some of that. Okay, that's the first question. Second question is, uh, well, why don't you answer that first? <laughs> Don't need to see if we have time. Go ahead. Happy to, Councilmember Lee. Um, yeah. In terms of the recruitments and leads, so yes, we do have a very strong partnership with Greater Seattle Partners, GSP, uh, which is the Regional Economic Development Group, and they are continuing to market the region um, as a great place to do business and to expand for businesses from outside the Puget Sound. So we're really leaning on them heavily at this point because they are the experts, um, have a deep uh, amount of knowledge um, and history in that space. We're also doing some individual prospecting, um, but to be quite honest, the uh, the pipeline is is very quiet at the moment because there are a lot of companies, especially the larger ones, waiting uh, to see how everything shakes out before making leasing commitments. But we are continuing to work with our active leads, both from GSP and from our individually sourced leads. Okay, so specifically, you know, the inquiry we have, uh, are they where do they come from? They just come from GSP or come from us or just on their own that they come to contact with us. And the majority come yeah. from GSP and we do oh. some, some individual uh, prospect work on our own as well. Okay, so, so question uh, time. Uh, you have worked also very well with the Chamber of Commerce and BDA and uh, you indicated there's a East Side recovery map to be launched. So I'm just asking what is the city of Bellevue's role uh, involvement in, the, in, in both of them? And are they just strictly BDA's work or Chamber's work, or are we very much involved and instrumental in those? Yeah, I can take that, Jesse. I, I would say they were engaged in all of them very hands-on. I think the map is actually, the East Side for All is, is the campaign effort that I think you're referring to. Uh, and that's really an effort in which we've come together with all of our East Side city partners, as well as organizations 
like the BDA, the chamber, one Redmond's, you know, Kirkland chamber, et cetera. And that's, so that's been a collaborative effort, but very hands-on by our staff, as well as um, the staff from, from those organizations to sort of develop a shared strategy uh, as um, in, in response to the, to the, the more local level, again, whether that's work with the, with the chamber, we've been in very good contact and, and frequently collaborating with them on, again, the idea, the assistance with PPP, uh, and coordinating how we can get those resources out, both with our team as well as with the uh, human services department, uh, and then again with the BDA, that's 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 really a partnership effort, and and they've really taken the, the ball and run with 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 our feedback and and developed that program. Thank you. My concluding comment would be, uh, as you are doing so well, and we still have spaces that potentially become vacant, and if they are not, we want to continue to attract people to come. So I'm just you know, wanting to mention to you that as when you get uh, inquiries, when you sign up new tenants, uh, I would like to know how much is it due to what specific effort so that we know which one we need to emphasize on, whether it's because of through our effort, through our regional partners effort, or just by word of mouth or whatever that is. I think that's good knowledge information to help us to you know, fill our space. Okay, thank you. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Council Member Lee. Good comments and questions. Um, okay, Council Member Zahn. Yes, thank you so much for the thorough report. I thought it was very helpful. I agree with the approach of the East Side collaboration and messaging regionally. I think the East Side together makes a lot of sense to create that partnership so that we're each contributing um, thank you for, I understand we've reached out to 20 different ethnic chambers of commerce to make sure that we are, uh, have an inclusive economy. I think that'll be really important. You know, my sense is that Amazon's choice to bring more jobs here, when they talk about quality of life, small business and having a robust uh, amount of businesses is gonna be, is one of the draws both for businesses as well as people that live here. So we want to definitely make sure that that continues to happen. Um, a couple of, of questions I did have, and that is that when we um, talked about some of the work of outdoor dining, winter's coming. So I'm wondering about what other strategies might, we might have, because unfortunately COVID is not leaving as quickly as we might want, even though the numbers are dropping in terms of the uh, exposure. So I'd like to hear a bit about that. And then the other one is, um, as we think about the office development continuing, which is great. And at the same time, it seems like we need to really then um, even increase our effort in affordable housing, making sure that our multimodal transportation to get people around and focusing on the environment. So as we look at that office development, it seems like we need to also be paying attention to that balance between office and residential as well. So um, would like to hear about um, both of those. And then the last one is, you talked about the focus on downtown restaurants, but there's also a lot of neighborhood restaurants that are also struggling. So are, do they have opportunities too to expand out in their, their parking lots so that they can continue to um, have people that maybe are able to dine at the restaurant? Thank you. Absolutely, Council Member. Um, thank you for those questions. And Chris, I think can address those very specifically. Sure. The, around um, outdoor dining. Sure, sure. So um, on the first, on your first question, a little bit about the, the what's next question, obviously our weather season here supports outdoor dining um, to, a, to a degree. Uh, but uh, I think you're asking the same question that we're asking right now. And actually, as a matter of fact, we have a, a session tomorrow morning where we've we've gathered um, a Zoom session gathered uh, virtually, but we are hosting kind of a feedback session for um, retailers and small businesses to sort of ask that question. Because I think, you know, uh, while we understand that there's been a, a great impact to that additional outdoor space, we want to know, again, what are some of their concerns as we do head into the winter? We know that some of our major events in downtown are not going to happen and draw the same foot traffic that they normally would through the holiday season. Uh, we want to understand and ask questions about how they actually have used some of those outdoor options so that they, you know, maybe there are ways that we can adapt them and adopt them to be, you know, more, more full season versus just seasonal. 
Um, so we're, we're kind of digging in on that issue right now. Obviously, it's also going to be connected to our promotional efforts and, and connecting all of our businesses to the Heart of Bellevue campaign and the East Side together so that they're actually seeing that added um, bump from the visibility of and, and tugging on people's heartstrings here in locally in Bellevue to go out and support our small businesses. So those, that's how I'd probably answer the first one. Uh, the, the last question about the outdoor dining options more citywide, you know, we do have temporary use permits that so businesses can apply for, and we've been doing pretty extensive outreach to, to property owners and businesses through our, through our networks and channels on that so that you can go in and apply to convert portions of your parking lot or uh, portions of your private property to, to expand your space. Mm, and I think okay. I had mentioned we'd seen five of those permits already um, in, in the city. Maybe warm blankets and heaters. <laughs> Umbrellas. Thank you. Council member, uh, thank you, Council Members. Council Member Robson. Muted. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> to join my colleagues in thanking you for the great report. Uh, and I really want to call out how hard the Economic Development Department has been working along with our um, partner agencies to really try to help our businesses and our community during COVID. I think it's, you've done so much and I appreciate you guys coming here to daylight it, but it doesn't, it only shows a fraction of the work. And I know that you guys have been working really hard on that. Um, so a couple of questions. One issue that's been coming up um, is with regard to internet reliability. As more people are working at home, as all of our K-12 kids are coming from home, um, we got an email to council today about um, glitches in the internet because there's so many people using particularly during the nine or eight period when all the school kids are on. Um, and you know, if you're in a household and you're working from home and you've got your kids on the internet, it doesn't matter how big of a um, system you have. If you have the most expensive broadband or internet, system it's your it's slowing you down so that's affecting business and that's affecting education so what if anything are we doing to try to address that issue that is a great question councilman robertson um and so we are discussing those particular issues with our, our it department as well uh, which oversees the franchising for um for all the service providers um and it is it is definitely an issue and we are we are contemplating what the steps the city might take to support more robust service um, as we as we look at potential long-term work from home and those those enhanced internet requirements. Great. I would love to have an, uh, an update on that when we know mm -hmm. more. Now, I just saw the Bellevue School District, we're at 77 cases per 100,000 uh, population as far as positive tests right now. When that gets to 75 and below um, for a two-week period, Bellevue School District is going to start their um, hybrid reopening, but still we're going to have kids at home every day. So this is going to probably remain an issue, plus all the work from home for a while. So I'd love to get an update on that when we know more. Um, second, on dining, um, I know I agree with council members on, you know, it's great to su uh, support the outdoor dining uh, as the weather changes, you know, there are outdoor heaters, but people are gonna need weather protection. And I know that um, temporary covers do require a building permit um, of some sort. So there's, you know, IFC review, et cetera, and that's international fire code um, for those playing alphabet bingo. But um, the, uh, do we have a way that we could streamline that so that we can um, help these folks, you know, when the weather starts to turn, be allowed to put stuff up as, you know, and it has to be safe, but is there a way we can streamline that? So we've been working really closely and I actually want to applaud our team and right away for just how much they've completely turned over every resource to try to support all the businesses through these applications and these permits because they're complicated and they require a lot of due diligence and they've really busted their tail to, to, to make them happen quickly. And so actually, as, as part of a question I think we're going to ask tomorrow, I think we've already heard from our right away team that they're willing to kind of consider a lot of options. I mean, whether again, from a safety perspective, that's sort of their first and foremost concern, but there are ways, you know, again, the, the, the existing cafe permit pro are, are year round. So you don't have to go back and reapply for a new permit. So it may, it's, it may be just a shorter pathway to amending something that you already have. And especially if you're not moving tables, you're not adding tables, there may be, you know, ways in which we can sort of evaluate those more quickly than we have, you know, 
it's typically taking someone through a normal process to get those permits off the uh, off the ground. So I think, and we do know that again, heaters are allowed and other things. Again, so long as the the appropriate distances and safety measures right. are taken. Okay, great. Glad to hear that. Um, finally, um, well, actually, two things. Uh, one is I it, with the falling COVID rates at you know Bellevue. I looked. I'm looking at the dashboard right now. The past 14 days, our positive rate's been 2.2 percent which is far below the 5% that CDC says is critical to starting to open up again. Uh, Do we have a plan yet in place for how to get the message out that it is safe to come out? It's safe to safe to frequent businesses. It's safe to eat out. How are, and if we don't, when can we expect to see something that we can roll out with our partners? So council member, I would say on that question, that is definitely, um, one of the impetuses behind the Heart of Bellevue work, as well as the uh, the East Side Together campaign that the Chamber is leading, to make sure that folks understand what are the, the changing um, conditions, what is it safe to do, what businesses are open, and to encourage folks to safely, um, where appropriate, participate in the economy. I, I failed to mention of this of the there's five real pillars to that campaign on the East Side. I mentioned the business friendly piece and our collaboration, etc. One of the fifth, one of those five pillars and, and real themes is about safety and um, sort of COVID response to that safety. And so that is exactly as Jesse said, one of the key things that the, the campaign will be messaging is that it is safe. Our businesses are safe. They take the best precautions, and this is a place you can feel good about coming out to shop, dine, etc. Right. And one of the reasons Bellevue's got such a low transmission rate is because, I think, because people are wearing masks. Um, people everywhere are wearing masks in business. And Bellevue's, hey, we're winning. Those that are watching at home, keep doing it. Because washing your hands and wearing masks, it's making it really safe. Finally, uh, I want to make sure that we work together with economic development uh, in what, as we're doing the budget for this year, both capital and operations for the things that we need to do to support our businesses, whether it's, you know, making sure that we have the transit, um, you know, working with our partners there, making sure that we have the right projects, making sure we're funding the operations that keep people investing in Bellevue. And that's gonna be even more important with the Amazon announcement. So um, Jesse, we're gonna be looking for advice from you about how to make sure that we are doing the right things uh, with this next budget. So thanks. Thank you. Council member Stokes. Yeah, great comments so far and uh, really, really appreciate the uh, presentation and uh, the focus and uh, a broad scope. I mean, you're doing a great job of balancing a lot of different things to make it all a much more um, a cohesive and uh, at the same time, very uh, reaching out into different areas that sometimes don't go together so well. Um, and uh, to follow up on some of these other uh, comments made, one of the things that I'm excited about is uh, with, and it's really great you're focusing on people going out and, and small businesses and eating out because that is that's something that people miss and I think will help uh, bring people back into downtown and, and the areas and I, I do agree we need to look out uh, past just downtown on this whole effort too. Um, you know one of the things that I was really excited about back in 2012 and going with BDA to Denver is going to Larimer Square and eating on the sidewalks and that was something we finally got around to so that's great and there are, have been some questions raised about how does that work and uh, the, the emphasis of, uh, or the questions of cars zooming by on the streets while people are eating and whether we're looking at uh, possibly having some streets be strictly for pedestrians and for uh, restaurants to, for eating outside. I know that's a, you know, it has a lot of pros and cons on that, but I just want to raise that issue uh, because we have gotten a couple of emails about that and uh, I know that's a concern, how that all works, but I think it's a great idea, and I hope we increase that uh, and actually do have more, uh, you know, bike and, and, and uh, uh, pedestrian uh, walkways and, tra- and trails and all that connect with the business and all. So I, I'm glad we're going, we're experimenting with that and we're working on that. So that's very, very good. Um, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, and, and I didn't hear anything about this in terms of East Side Together, and I think this obviously in our, uh, you know, our, uh, all the work we're doing regionally is very important. Bellevue is a great leader in the region. And one of the things that connects us also, and it should be kind of included in this, is the East Rail. Um, because that's, you know, we have a, that, that's a multi-county uh, a vehicle as well. 
but uh, it does tie us together. And one of the places uh, in the future we can look to is having uh, events along the rail and it connects so many other pieces. So I'd like to see a little emphasis on that as, as it's developing. And uh, you know, the partnership has grown very strong. And again, it's the same people who are working on the economic development piece and it's part of that. And the other thing that I really, uh, really um, congratulate you on is uh, tying in with uh, Bellwether and all the other aspects of um, the creative economy and, and um, arts and culture in Bellevue as a part of this whole piece because people come here and we will continue to attract big business, small businesses in between if we have a vibrant uh, restaurant, culture, uh, arts, uh, music uh, atmosphere in Bellevue. And uh, we can be the premier city for that. So I think these are all good things that we're doing and I really appreciate uh, the work that's been put together on that. And, uh, you know, I do think we have to uh, look at what's, what's happening now with people, how are people affected in the city or, you know, current uh, residents affected by COVID, how are they affected by all the different things that have changed. And I think what you're doing and what BDA and the Chamber and the city is doing is really helping people focus on uh, looking at it in a positive way as we go forward. Uh, I think that gives us all great hope that uh, when this nightmare is over, we're going to come out in a really good space. And the work you're doing is really leading to that. So I really appreciate that and, and, and the work your department's doing. So I'm excited about it. Looking forward to your further reports. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Stokes. Deputy Mayor Noonhouse. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I'll echo what uh, my colleagues have said. Great report, a lot of positives here. Um, just a couple additional uh, comments and questions. So um, my my first comment is that I'm so glad you have that um, that quote in there from that restaurant owner. I was actually dining on Main Street on on Friday night, and it was amazing how many people that were, were out um, and taking advantage of the expanded um, outdoor dining. Um, and uh, after talking to a couple of additional business owners, multiple um, said that uh, they'd love to do this, um, not only potentially year round, but potentially make sure they do it again next summer. Um, I think there is appetite to, um, to, to somehow um, uh, allow for outdoor dining, even when the weather turns a bit colder and it does get into rainy season, there does seem to be some appetite to, to do that. Uh, but definitely want to bring back the expanded uh, outdoor dining and, and, and seating areas, regardless if we're out of the pandemic or not, there, there, there truly is a, um, a, an appetite for that. And it really did add just a great atmosphere on, on, on Main Street as well. You know, I, I think going forward, that's just gonna be just a great thing for the city to attract even more restaurants and more patrons to, uh, to Maine, but throughout the rest of the city as well. I'm just speaking to Maine because uh, that's where I was at. Um, but I really want to uh, implore the residents um, of, of Bellevue to, as much as they possibly can, continue to, um, go to or order from uh, Bellevue restaurants, continue to go or order from small businesses, et cetera, because you know, our economic development team is working very hard, uh, coming up with a lot of great um, solutions, but um, you know, a lot of them are, are, are somewhat temporary. I mean, just like we're talking about here with the outdoor dining or a, a temporary loan um, or a grant that's only gonna last for so long. And I'm so glad to hear that um, you know, the, um, uh, the, the, the Together East Side, um, we're, we're, we're trying to encourage more folks to get out. Uh, and, that's, and, and that's really, really important because if our residents don't support, and it's more than just our residents in, in the surrounding area, but if they don't support our small businesses, and I'm talking restaurants, arts, um, other small businesses that are that, that are surviving, but they can only survive so long on a lot of these temporary measures. So I just want to put that out there. Really hope that our our, our residents really try to, um, uh, you know, go go to all the great small businesses in, in in our city. It's so crucial. It really is. Um, especially um, this is going on for six months now, and uh, we don't know how much longer this is going to go. 
So um, now, uh, Councilmember Stokes uh, did mention the the arts, and I wanted to to get a little bit more information on that, Jesse, if I could, because I think you did a really great um, wrap up here of uh, again a lot of restaurants and other small businesses, but. For me, what I keep hearing too is that the arts sector of our city is hurting um, very much right now. And I'm quite frankly, you know, I know this is a priority for a lot of my colleagues, and I, you know, and, I, and I'm really concerned about what the arts sector is going to look like in our city after this pandemic. Um, I, you know, I know some of them are barely surviving right now. Is there any other? Um, information you have on, on that sector, or is there anything else that you're working on right now that could be of help to these art organizations? Yes, Deputy Mayor, thank you for that question. Um, so there are a couple of different things that we're doing to help support the arts community. Um, so one um, important thing is that arts organizations and creative businesses are eligible for the small grant, small business grants. Um, so that's a key piece right there. Um, two is we are, um, we did expand our, um, capacity building program, our power up program to help our arts organizations understand how they can improve their business practices or le level up, I'll say, this year um, to help with uh, meeting the, the demands and, and pivot that they need to do during COVID. Our arts manager, Scott McDonald, has also been uh, individually meeting with our arts organizations. I think he's done nearly 30 individual one-on-one -on -one sessions with our arts organizations to understand where they are, um, what kind of assistance do they need, we are participating in um, now bi-weekly calls with the um, reconstituted Eastside Arts and Culture Coalition um, to help understand what the, the ecosystem is looking like on the east side. And then one of the big things that we have done that we have not concluded the, uh, the report yet, so we don't have the official numbers for you tonight, but we did partner with our neighboring cities on the east side to do an arts participation survey to understand um, what are the artistic or cultural um, experiences that Eastside residents are looking for. What will, will, do they want to do things virtually? Do they want to do things in person? Um, what level of safety measures or, um, or virus control will need to be in place before they'll engage in some of those activities again? And I'm very happy to say that we got nearly 1,100 responses from across the east side to help inform. And the reason that we did that particular survey is we want to arm our arts organizations with user data and customer data so that they can make informed decisions about how to pivot their business model. And I think one of the, the great examples right now is that um, winter grass will be coming back in a different format this, this coming year. So while they won't be able to do the big event that takes up all of the rooms in uh, the Bellevue Hyatt, they will be doing more curated experiences to continue that, that um, experience, that, that uh, spirit of winter grass until they can come back, hopefully in 2022. So we are working with our arts organizations to, to make those digital pivots as much as they can and be ready for when it's safe to do things in person again. Thanks, Jesse. That's a great answer. And um, yeah, that's really what I'm looking for. It's like, what can we be doing right now to prepare for, um, for example, the Bellevue Arts Fair? You know, what can we do now? And it sounds like you're doing some great due diligence and research right now, but what can we do to prepare for that? The pandemic is still not over. We want mm -hmm. to move forward with the with the fair, but obviously we need to put different uh, processes in place to make it safe for everybody or uh, other performances, maybe outdoor performances or other uh, other other avenues that these art organizations can take to, uh, to remain active and, and alive in this community. So thank you so much for that. Appreciate it. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Council Member Barksdale. All right, thank you, Mayor. So a lot of good questions. Uh, a couple that I've had in mind that have already been addressed, but I just want to emphasize is just really making sure that we're covering all of Bellevue with the work that we're doing. Um, I know we're City Hall and the Chamber and BDA are all in West Bellevue, but really looking at ways that I just want to encourage us to continue to look at the ways to get across Bellevue with, this, with what we're doing. Um, in terms of the financial assistance, I think you said 200, there have been 200 applications. How many have been awarded and what's the distribution by like industry? If you don't have it, I can, you can send it to me later. Um, and I guess just one of the other industries that I would also encourage for us to consider is uh, childcare. So just curious about how we've been looking at that, that industry as well. 
Uh, happy to answer those questions, Council Member. So with the, the grants question in particular, we have not awarded those yet. Um, so the application process is still open through September 17th, I believe. Um, and so at that point, we'll be going through the lottery system. And because of the nature of the funds, we do have to come back to council for final approval before those uh, dollars are dispersed. We are hoping to do that on consent uh, sometime in October so that way we can expeditiously get that money back out into the community. Um, and we will be able to report at that point full demographic sweep on size, uh, background, et cetera, for the businesses. With regards to uh, childcare, it is definitely a, an item that comes up um, very much in our discussions um, across the board. We don't have any um, good solutions or recommendations at this point. We're still very much in discovery mode on that, but we definitely understand that child care is a big issue. We have seen reports that as many as 50% of the child care businesses could go out of business um, over the course of the pandemic. So it's definitely top of mind because it, it was an issue before the pandemic and will continue to be one after. Yeah, I, um, you know, I'm thinking about sort of the larger change, but also the neighborhood child care centers as well, um, because I think there's a lot of value in those as well that we want to support. Absolutely. We will continue to study that topic. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, Deputy Mayor, do you have any comments uh, from the human services perspective on funding for child care? Um, I can tell you that's an active conversation and we're constantly looking to, to fund those organizations in a way that can help relieve parents who are um, uh, un unable to go to work because they, they don't have that, uh, that daycare facility there. So it is top of mind, you know, certainly with the additional um, funds that we're receiving from Amazon, we are going to be able to fund more organizations and, and hopefully uh, be able to uh, help address this uh, e even more because it is a clear need in the community. Yeah, I'm just wondering to make sure that it doesn't fall through the cracks that maybe we could have human services and economic development talk together about looking mm -hmm. at childcare as a community need as well as a business. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Mayor. And I'll make sure that uh, that indeed is happening. Thank you. Okay, um, I just had a couple of questions. First of all, I, I reflect on my co colleagues' comments. Uh, excellent job. This is all really good to hear. Really appreciate getting apprised of uh, the latest information on Bellevue. Um, and we've got good news. You know, we've got some challenges, but we have a lot of good news, which I feel blessed. Um, in terms of the uh, restaurants that eat dining on Main Street, I, I live down there now, so I got to participate in uh, seeing that before and after. And boy, what a, what a wonderful thing that is. Just the energy now and um, you know, not being able to get reservations until like nine o'clock at night on a weeknight, that's crazy. But that's, that's, uh, that's how successful it is, so very good. But I, I noticed that there is a bunch of parking, maybe three or four on-street spaces right next to Franz Chocolates that just have planters. And I'm wondering, why aren't we utilizing that space? Do you have plans to utilize it or what's the deal with that? Sure, I can speak to that. Um, and I, I would, again, I think we'll probably want to give a fuller debrief again when we come back on on how we engineered all of this with our with our partners in right away. I think I think we we did explore every inch of of, of Old Bellevue for opportunities. And I think there was a concern with because that's at a T intersection that there could be some sort of traffic. You know, if someone stops paying attention, runs that light coming from the south, they would be you know heading directly towards. Uh, towards potentially a, a dangerous situation. So I know that was one of the concerns, um, but uh, again, we, we did look at all of the, the options and, and, and we'll give a full debrief on, on kind of uh, on the mechanics of that when we come back in, uh, in November. Thank you. I'm just wondering if we can return it to parking spaces, if it's not gonna be used for any dining, it seems like it's being uh, just kind of wasted parking space. So just to look into that would be good as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the other question was kind of what Council Member Barksdale said, what are we doing for the other parts of, of Bellevue for Crossroads businesses and Eastgate and Wilburton and, and all those uh, other areas that have small business? Are we looking to 
do creative things to help them as well? So I can tackle that one first, and then Chris uh, can definitely share what he and uh, his team are working on. So Mayor and, and Council, absolutely, we are looking at different opportunities across the city. Um, there are definitely some uh, you know, bandwidth and capacity challenges. There are, there are many needs compared to staff hours, um, but we are working with um, Visit Bellevue and other organizations like the owners of Factoria Mall and the management group over at Crossroads to make sure that the information is out to them and they will be participating in hopefully in future sessions, we'll do listening sessions to understand how we can help them further navigate um, and improve the situation throughout the pandemic. Um, I will know that there is a plan, a strategy in the economic development plan update that does call for creating more um, merchant associations because there is a need for more groups like the BDA and the Old Bellevue Merchants Association to help us as community partners in developing those solutions. That's great. Okay, thank you very much. I think that uh, that's ev everybody. So thank you again for the great presentation. Okay. Uh, so, Council Member Lee asked that a particular item be pulled from the consent calendar, and I believe we can have staff do a brief presentation on that. Mr. Miyake, did you want to introduce sure, item Mayor. F for us? Sure, Mayor. This was um, item 8F on your consent calendar, which was a resolution uh, 9815 authorizing the execution of a general services contract regarding fabrication and installation of um, Art along the northeast corner gateway of the downtown park. Um, uh, this uh, comes um, uh, after this has been in front of council for a number of times um, in terms of the artwork itself. Joining us this evening is Mac Cummins as well as Michael Shiyasaki. Mac is the director of community development and uh, Michael is the director of the parks department. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Mac, for uh, as well as Michael for a brief. Um, description of the project and uh, any other information you'd like to share that you feel is relevant for the council mm -hmm. in making a decision whether or not to approve this resolution. Yeah. Or, thank you, City Manager. <laughs> um, it's nice to see everybody here this evening. Um, it's nice to be able to be live too as well. Um, so I, I'll make a few brief remarks on this tonight. Um, we brought this back to you on consent calendar. It may seem like a, a lifetime ago now. Um, this was one of the very last study sessions the city council held before COVID um, and the stay home, stay healthy already order was issued. In February, the council had a study session specifically to look at this piece of public art um, and public art uh, may not be do apt description to what um, the piece itself is. It's actually an integral component of the the park and the North, the gateway into the downtown park at Northeast 4th and Bellevue Way. And the February study session was the culmination of roughly two years worth of planning on this particular effort. So sometime before that, the city council adopted Grand Connection Framework Plan, um, a number of other policy documents, um, an arts and culture plan relating to the Grand Connection. Um, and began the process of looking at a variety of different ways to uh, in, improve placemaking in and around urban areas and specifically in the downtown. In those documents, uh, that corner entry point to downtown park at Northeast 4th and Bellevue Way was identified as a quote unquote key gateway. And that key gateway was meant to have a series of features meant to be placemaking, uh, driving people, uh, pedestrians particularly, in and out of the park and into um, the downtown as you think of the Grand Connection route. So as the city went about how to uh, execute those concepts and implement them, we started on a multidisciplinary effort, some of which was park design related and some of which was arts related. So the parks department was working on the, um, the parks design and the city had its art commission working on the selection of an artist and ideas around uh, what type of art could be placed here as part of that key gateway concept. Council actually had multiple study sessions through those two year processes, but it was the February session where the final decision was made on this particular um, item, which is the piece of art. And council uh, saw the art that evening and then directed us to bring this back to you on consent. Um, and then between that point and now, obviously we had the COVID time period uh, and then worked out a few, a few final details and brought it here to you this evening. So 
um, you know, with that, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to stop and take questions if the council has any at this time. Um, otherwise, I think the, I know the artist is ready to get going um, and construction on the parks already started. You can see some of the, the framing out there and where some of the initial concrete's going. Uh, I'll go ahead and, and let everybody have a chance to speak. We're, we'll do it in this order, starting with Council Member Lee, then Barksdale, Deputy Mayor Noonhouse, Council Member Zahn, Robertson, Stokes, and then me. So, Council Member Lee. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I uh, appreciate uh, pulling this item from the consent calendar so that we have a little more you know, discussion on it. Uh, I have some, you know, to, to allow me to allow me to uh, to share with everyone, you know, my concern. Um, my concern is not about the project. You know, this is a great project. We are agree. We are approved. And uh, as you have heard from the previous discussion on economic development, art is a very important piece of the stool on economic development. Even more than that, it's part of. Uh, our community's quality of life, you know, so it's important, very important. So it's not a question about the project itself. I fully support it. And, uh, you know, the question really is a matter of timing. Uh, we've just, you know, in the midst, <laughs> I was going to say we've just gone through COVID-19. I'm being optimistic. We're not. We don't know how long it's going to last. But we see the impact of COVID-19. Uh, lots of people are suffering. Uh, people, you know, uh, more than that, you know, people are uh, suffering just from you know, losing, lost income, loss of security. Uh, economy is down so far and don't know how long it's going to be. But the reality is even today, uh, I don't know how many of us have to go into grocery stores. Uh, and this, this year alone, grocery prices has gone up 25%, one quarter increase. Uh, so it, it's a, a, a not a uh, right time. So I, well, I saw this and I just felt that uh, there's a lot of, and also heard, just heard from previous discussion, there are many, many, many things we want to do, we want to accomplish. Many things is important to us, no question about it. And we've been very lucky. Belgium is a very good city. People are responsible. Economy is good. And, but don't forget, because economy is good. We are able to afford a lot of things. And but now the situation has changed. Like any other cities, we are also being hit. We know we are facing this shortfall. Uh, you know, we're going to have our budget deliberation coming up. We're going to be making tough decisions. Uh, we are asking the staff to tighten our but our belt. You know, we we are going to do some tough choices, priorities. So I'm just thinking that in light of all these uh, comparison, this juggling of projects that we know and we don't know. We're going to be hearing from the staff, from city manager, uh, how we're going to juggle all these. And the, the one that stand out right now, you know, which, you know, it's ch difficult. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but I'm just looking at it, that it's a project that may be able to defer, not even on the merit of itself, but the, in comparing to other projects we want to do when we facing the budget deliberation that's coming up on us. And so I, I ask, what, what is the uh, uh, consequence? What is the, uh, the impact uh, you know, of not doing it now, doing it a little bit later, whatever that may be? It is a, what, what is the cost breakdown of the $810,000? That's a big chunk of money. It is a lot of money that we are just providing for people who need rent, rent of provision protections. We need to put food on the table. You know, there's a lot of things we need to do. So I, I would love to have the opportunity to hear from staff. What's the cost breakdown? Uh, what, what are we talking about? How much are we going, going to be impacted if we defer the project? You know, if it's impossible, I'd like to hear that. Uh, I, you know, I, yeah. And I haven't got that answers yet, and we haven't heard the discussion on it, but I really would love to. And then we can decide, is it worthwhile to talk about? Is it something we can cover with something else? What do we have to give up in order to do this? And what is the cost? Of cost? What's the benefit of comparing with other projects we want to do? And we heard the whole year for it. I'm sure we can just count on our hands, maybe hands and feet. Uh, but 
So without this information, I, I would just feel that it would be very hard to let people you know, see that it's hard for me to justify to people that we're spending this much money and maybe even more to do this, and which doesn't have an immediate impact on economic recovery, on getting people back to work by keeping people you know, safe and doing whatever we have to do. There's a lot of things we have to do. So I would like to propose actually, because without the information I was asking for, you know, how, how much latitude do we have? Well, I know there may be more, some people suggested there may be even higher costs if we de delay it. That's fine. I like to know what it is, right? If it's $5, you know, <laughs> I think we can handle that. But if it's half a million dollars, it might not be worth it, but we'd like to know what it is. And the, the, what 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 would be the increased cost? And what's the impact? And then what is the avoidable? And what is not avoidable if we defer the project? And how long? So this information I'd like to have. So uh, my proposal would be let's uh, take the time for the staff to give us that information, you know, to, so that we can look at it. We can have facts and information to to make those decisions. You know, what is it? How much are we talking about? What is the impact? You know, what's avoidable, what's not avoidable. Then we can make a decision. Then we can explain to our citizens, you know, this is how we decide on spending valuable resources at a time when people, you know, are <laughs> going through this moment. So. Okay, Council Member Lee, we've, we've heard your request. Thank and you. so I'm going to Thank ask you. that everybody, every council member have a chance to uh, speak to this. So. Uh, before we engage with staff. So Council Member Barksdale, you're next. All right, thank you, Mayor. Um, I appreciate the sentiments of Council Members Lee's remarks. Um, I would say though, <clears throat> that, you know, we've talked about continuing to support the arts. Um, it appears to me that this is already largely funded. And I think especially during this time when people are indoors and sort of disconnected, I mean, I see the arts as a way to help bring more of that energy and, and help with the uh, mental health of the people in our community. So I actually think it would be um, in our best interest to continue with the project. I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Deputy, Deputy Mayor Newenhouse. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I too um, you know, really appreciate uh, Council Member Lee's uh, comments here. Um, always the fiscal hawk and always looking out for the best use of um, taxpayer dollars. I really appreciate um, him uh, flagging this issue. Um, and for me, I would just need to know more as well. And I'm sorry if my camera looks a little bit uh, darker at this at this moment. You can't see me clearly, but um, um, I would like some information on this as well. Clearly, you know, Council Member Lee is correct. There are a lot of people hurting. There's businesses hurting. But this is also, um, you know, something that we did approve, what, six, seven months ago. It has been budgeted. Um, completely agree with Council Member Barksdale that, you know, the arts do play um, and should play a very important role. Uh, there is something to be said about um, outdoor uh, park art experience and, and and this project will certainly enhance that. I think it really will be enjoyed uh, tremendously by residents and give them more reasons to be out and and to uh, yeah, interact with people. I mean certainly you know given the latest statistics on on mental health, this is critical. Um, so, um, but however, s saying that, you know, I think that these are good questions that uh, Council Member Lee is, is, is asking and, and, and if uh, staff uh, has some of those answers today, that's great. If we had to wait a week for staff to get some answers in terms of um, what would happen if we did delay this project, um, you know, w would there be significant um, costs associated with that? Um, you know, I think those are still good questions to ask and I, you know, and I would appreciate having uh, that data Data before making a final decision. Thank you. Council members on. Yes, thank you. Um, I appreciate the comments and, and Council Member Lee uh, pulling the consent items so we can have this conversation because I do think it is a lot of money that we're spending. It is an anchor piece that the Arts Commission looked at very carefully and considered what we wanted to do. And the arts are a part of what makes Bellevue a vibrant community that draws businesses and people that want to live here and work here. So those things are important. I will say that when, when this item came to the council in February, 
I remember asking the question about um, are these types of things, especially this large dollar value, one that we can find some partners that might be uh, willing to provide some level of funding? And I think at the time, the discussion was that that isn't something that we had pursued. So perhaps this is an opportunity to talk about whether there's any possibilities there or not um, and get a better sense for the questions about what would it look like if it um, was delayed. I do think that if we've already got um, a contract imminent that there are gonna be costs associated with any kind of delay. And so I think we need to be making those kinds of decisions very carefully before we actually choose to halt or suspend for any length of time. So I look forward to hearing from staff about some of these questions that have been asked. Council Member Robertson. Thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, Council Member Lee having this pulled so we can talk about it. I am really personally very excited about this project. When we saw the renderings uh, on February 3rd and the council said, bring it back on consent. I think to a person, we were all very excited. Now we didn't know COVID was gonna happen but we are under construction on this gateway piece right now. We've had people complaining, um, or not complaining, opining, sharing their views uh, about the loss of trees that we're taking out to build the space. If we don't, it, not putting the art piece in would be the same thing as not replanting trees when we're taking trees down to work on a park. You have to replace the space with something. You can't just leave a big gap. And this is a really important piece. It is livability, it's mental health, it's economic development, it's community building. This is a really important gateway piece. We prioritized it. The art is part of it. Um, I don't know how we would all feel if you know some other agency was doing a project and they decided to just leave all the nice finishes undone and blank. I don't think we would feel very good about it. And I think the people that use and live near and work near this park would be pretty appalled if we just left a big space of cement without filling it with anything. And that's what this does. It creates a gathering spot and it creates shade. It creates a place where people can eat their lunches. Um, and it creates beauty in our, in our city. Um, it is supposed, if we get, don't delay this contract, it's gonna be done over the winter and ready for people to enjoy before spring. To me, that's really important because if we delay this, then we're constructing the park when the weather comes back, uh, when the good weather comes back, I mean to say, and then people can't use that space and we've taken something away and not put anything back. So, and this is capital money, so we can't exactly yank it out of here and start spending it um, on operations and other types of, um, you know, it's a different color of money. We can't do that. And so, uh, you know, I'm, as everyone knows, I'm a huge supporter of the parks. I'm also, you know, a huge supporter of making sure that we do what we need to bring our businesses back. Making the right investments in our community that create beauty and gathering spaces and stimulate um, that activity is just as important as it is of helping people pay their rent during the downtimes, because that's what's going to help lead Bellevue back into the future. And so um, I, I'm, I hope council can, or not council, hope staff can answer some of the council's questions tonight. But um, if they can't, I am still comfortable moving on with this. We had a robust discussion about this in February and I'm really, really excited about this and don't wanna wait. The money's budgeted, let's get it going. I can't wait for the ribbon cutting in February or March when the uh, sun starts to come back again. So thanks. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Stokes. Yeah, I, um, I was really, really surprised. I was surprised as the uh, days on the Arts Commission, I wasn't uh, made aware of this uh, at the time and I would have appreciated comments between council members. Um, but uh, frankly, uh, <laughs> my colleague just said, uh, things that I wanted to say. I mean, I think uh, Councilman Robertson just hit the nail on the head and, um, and all those aspects of it. And I don't know what staff's gonna tell us that we haven't been told before, but we can go through this process. Um, and, uh, but I, I think it's, it, it meets a lot of criteria and a lot of things we were talking about earlier in the creative economy aspect. It, it's 
it's uh, staff, it's people working. It is something that's important in these times like this to have something that is uplifting. It's something that, uh, that's what art and culture is about. And uh, I mean, it's already, this is, this is something that, that this train has kind of left the station. And so putting a halt on it at one will cost time. It may have some real problems with the, uh, with the artist. It may have some problems with the construction, all these other factors. And we're just opening up a kind of a can of worms in a sense. And again, I, and I, I like the uh, picture that Councilman Robertson painted. I, I think people who are worried about and, and under all this stress from the COVID, the, the pandemic, are gonna look at that piece just sitting there for the concrete and everything else. And the question will get around like, well, the Bellevue, the council's kind of pulling out of this thing. They're not gonna do this, whatever they don't. And, and that's just gonna have a, I think a negative effect on people. And and we, we're, this is not all about just dollars and cents or, or you know, concrete or buildings. It's about people and making people feel that Things are good. Things are good are happening, and this is a great place to be. And again, this is this is something that we've talked about for decades in the whole, the whole Grand Connection and and making this whole piece, particularly there, something that is inviting. It's it's something that's uplifting. It's something that that goes to the heart of why we do arts and culture. And uh, again, uh, as 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 has been said, we've had discussions about this. We've talked about this. The information's been there. We've had a lot of time in between who was coming back and, and no questions have been asked. And all of a sudden at the very end, the question's asked. So I, I think there's some real uh, questions, you know, we need we can get the answers to some of those questions about the timing, but uh, I think it's just gonna cost us a lot more down the line. We may just mess a project up that is, is great. So I uh, appreciate uh, the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes, I agree. Council member Robertson, you really did hit it on the, head for me as well. And, and if you want to think about uh, a project that got its budget cut, think about the uh, Maiden Bower Convention Center. Have you ever wondered what all those pipes and, and troughs are at the entrance? That is an incomplete art project. And how many, that was built in 1993. And we have never come back and finished that. So that's, I fear that happening again. I fear for the artist who is committed to getting this amount of money and probably has already completed the work and not getting paid as a, as a business person. And I'm concerned about uh, the extra cost, like with the downtown park, uh, getting that last quarter finished and it was delayed a year and that cost the city a million dollars just because uh, somebody wanted to think about parking. Um, so I don't, I don't feel like we need to add any additional money to this project. And that brings me around to the eight hour rule. So we have only three people who are interested in revisiting this um, extensively. Uh, so I'm not going to ask staff to come back at another session, but we are here tonight and you've heard council members lease questions and the council members on uh, also and deputy mayor. If there's anything that you can address tonight, that would be of interest to them, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Sure, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'll have a few comments and probably need uh, Michael Shiyosaki to weigh in on a couple of things too. Um, so when we talk about potentially delaying, I think a number of council members here have correctly identified what the impact of not putting the piece of public art into the, the project would be. It would be an incomplete, concrete patio, you know, with no shade effectively as the gateway entrance. Um, the, the physical impact would be we're designing the, the plaza right now with footings and things to, so that you can anchor a fairly significant structure into the concrete. So when we talk about delaying, there's a point in time where that can no longer happen because you've already poured concrete into the ground. So you couldn't actually retrofit and drop a significant structure on top of the concrete without taking things out and significant cost at that point. You'd be reconstructing something you just constructed. So in terms of the timing, a delay beyond a, a mattering of, of weeks would be the, the absolute drop dead date because otherwise you would have constructed something you'd have to rip out to put in new. So the actual timing, I think I'll have Michael speak to. His group is already under contract 
uh, and installing all of that foundation work now, anticipating this large um, shade covering piece of art. And he can walk you through where that construction cycle is. Thank you. Well, you know, and I, I, I just have to say, you know, part of the magic of this project at the Northeast Corner, it marries the past vision of the downtown park, this 35-year vision, with kind of the future vision of the Grand Connection, and it all comes together at the Northeast Corner of the downtown park. Um, you know, I think what's been designed really integrates the landscape and art together. So I don't think of the art as a separate piece. It's just one project. It's been broken into two segments though. You know, the park landscape is under construction now. The plaza where the piece of art will be, um, will be constructed as a part of the landscape project, but then seamlessly the park project will end and then the artist uh, fabrication and installation will happen seamlessly right after that. So it's really one period of construction, one period of disruption for the public before it can be opened next spring. So, you know, there is some magic in all this happening at once. Um, and, and, and like I said, it's really, it's, it, the park landscape creates kind of the access, the, the entryway, but it's really the art that creates the space for people and the celebration space. And I think it is one project all together in, I'll say two separate little, two separate contracts. So thank you. So council member Lee, you brought up something really interesting about public private partnerships. And I, I think it's too late to consider that for this, but it's not too late to start thinking about that for the future. And I'd like you to ask that you work with council member Stokes as uh, chair of the liaison to the arts commission and, and possibly um, staff, but maybe you and council member Stokes can come up with something to present to staff that we could consider as a city in terms of developing those public private partnerships and applying them to our, to our arts projects like that. Would that work for you? Oh. Yes, uh, thank you for making that bold suggestion. <laughs> I appreciate it because, uh, uh, you know, uh, I would be happy to, you know, as I mentioned, uh, I support this unquestionably and reservedly. It's just a matter of uh, timing. And so I'm looking for uh, reasons and which, you know, I think the staff trying to articulate uh, that he, number one, you know, uh, Michael Shosaki, he used the word magically, you know, that's hard to, to defend, <laughs> you know, so uh, what is that, right? But I have to have something, you know, unfortunately, I'm an engineer in training, so I need to have something concrete to grapple with. Uh, yes, I'll be happy to do that to understand. And also I believe magic. I do believe in magic. That's why I'm a I'm on a city council. If you don't believe in magic, you should not be in politics. <laughs> so Okay. So all right. Thank the, you. The, yeah. So uh, the one thing again is in working with the uh, council members. So I just want to be sure that the characterization that we are under we are understanding that this is not something I just dreamed up last minute. No, it is something that we're just aware that we need to spend money. And COVID-19 just happened you know, six months ago. Uh, well, the impact of it, I won't say happened. I don't know when it happened. Nobody knows for sure. But okay, the impact, we're feeling the impact of it, even knowing more of it. So this is, to me, a new conversation and realistic conversation based on what's happening, that impact on people. That's it. So if we can work to, on that basis with that understanding, I think that'd be great. But if we don't agree on the premises that we don't, you know, then it'll be difficult, but I'd be happy to give it a shot. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, Deputy Mayor, can you make a motion, please? Certainly, Mayor. Uh, I move to adopt Resolution 9815, authorizing execution of a general services contract regarding fabrication and installation of a landmark artwork um, as part of the Northeast Corner Gateway, the downtown park with artists, the very many, an amount not to exceed $810,000 plus all applicable taxes to build and install artwork celebrating this key location of the Grand Connection in downtown and support the growth of tourism in downtown Bellevue. Second. All those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. All those opposed? I will still vote no, uh, but in the spirit of, uh, you know, co collaboration, I hope, you know, we'll work on it. Yeah, so I have to vote for no without the information, the facts that, you know, give me the uh, assurance and or is peace of mind, let's say. Okay, so I vote for no. Okay. So that passes. And so I guess in the spring, we'll have a beautiful completed gateway to our downtown park with an installation and it will be all completed. Thank you very much staff for explaining that to us. And thank you council member Lee for bringing that up. Thank I you very much is... council members for taking the time to share. Thanks. I think this brings us to the close of the meeting. Thank you very much. We will see you next week. The meeting is adjourned.